Criminal justice reform does not mean letting people out of jail. It means holding them accountable and putting them in jail. When you don't solve a cold case, you leave the, the perpetrator on the street. So has she left like this before? Yeah, never. That's what, that's... And it's not common for her to be gone like late at night? No, yeah, not especially since my daughter got out of the hospital. Jessica wasn't just trash that was thrown away. The fact that you have no idea what's going on is absurd. So I put in there, you know, I'm like, would, would you think I would hurt her or something? The mayor has asked the federal justice department for help cleaning up the New Orleans police, long plagued by what many see as a culture of corruption. I mean, why did the family find her fucking body and not the police? You don't care enough to make sure that you have the right person in the crosshairs of the legal justice system. Then you are ignoring evidence and you're ignoring the person that caused the real harm. Well, I don't want to be sexist, but women tend to do that, you know, at least to me, put it that way. I mean, so close to home, too. Like, what an utter failure. This tells you that this can happen to anybody. Nobody is immune from crime. Justice to me is being in a courtroom and the person who did this to my sister, the judge says guilty. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Lights Out. It is a wild one. It's honestly one of those cases that's almost like too crazy to believe this happened. And it reached a point where I, th I did feel as if, if I stay, I think I might die. And first, are you making this by your own free will? Yes. Anybody pay you? Anybody threaten you? Anybody coerce you? I don't remember. I blocked it out. And there's, there are so many holes in my memory. She also claimed that Larry had personal connections with Mikhail Gorbachev. If he's able to get in with people like that, like, and then he decides to target me, yeah, what chance did I have? I'm not going to know better than, like, you know, a, the former head of the KGB. But Mr. Ray is no child. He is a calculating, manipulative, and hostile man. Light out. Everybody. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Lights Out. Back in the studio with the boys, Austin, Danny. How's it going, guys? It's going good. Going all right. Going all right. I'm uh, barely, barely awake after this wild uh, holiday party we had this weekend. Yeah. Uh, good times. Yeah. I'm still, I mean, it's like two days later, but I'm still feeling it. Yeah. Yesterday was just like Gone. zombie yeah. all day. Same did not want to do anything just kind of recuperating and researching today's episode extensively uh, because it is a whoa it is a wild one it's honestly one of those cases that's almost like too crazy to believe that this this happened and if you haven't heard of the sarah lawrence sex cult or maybe you've seen the docuseries on hulu called stolen youth it, this is like i mean this dad Larry Ray moves into his daughter's dorm room, or it's really a college house with all of her roommates, and then effectively turns everybody into cult members and just absolutely takes advantage of them to to no end. I mean, it's it's a it's just fucking crazy. Yeah. You don't hear about this every day. Yeah, no. And I know I've been mentioning, especially the last few episodes, I feel like I always mention manipulators terrify me. This is the. He might take the. This, yeah, this is quintessential manipulation, to I, a whole uh, nother level too. Yeah, to the point where he, we'll see. He schmoozes people. He he goes way up the political lines too. Uh, just grade A narcissistic manipulator here. Yeah, it's it's mind blowing stuff. But before we get into it, you, if you're watching the episode on Spotify or YouTube, you might notice that we have these beautiful trophies on our table here. And if you're wondering what these are, these are our awards for winning the Signal Awards for Paranormal or Horror category. We actually, we took first, despite this being silver, um, it's silver because of the way that they judge the category and there's like certain scores to get yourself uh, another gold one. But out of the three finalists, we ended up winning that category over Rain Wilson's uh, 
paranormal podcast, which is pretty cool. Yeah, which I like. Wild. I like that podcast. Yeah, too. it's a good it's show. Crazy that we we beat them out on that one. And a lot of that is well, actually, this one is just based off of the judges. So just the judges awarded us this um, silver uh, winner for for that particular category. And then the gold one is thanks to you guys out there. This is a listener's choice award. Uh, if you remember, you know, a month or two ago, we were asking you guys to go vote for us. Well, you came through and you delivered gold. And so the gold one here is our listener's choice for paranormal horror podcast. So very exciting stuff. It feels really good to kind of, I don't know. I don't know why I like trophies, but <laughs> yeah, it makes me feel good. These are like 40 pounds too. <laughs> yeah, these are like solid, man. Yeah. You could take someone out with one of these. Yeah. But uh, thank you guys for for voting for us. And just, I mean, this year's just been crazy in all the best ways. I mean, just the show is just on a whole nother level from where it was a couple of years ago. And also thanks to you two uh, for helping helping me get to where we want to go. And just next year, we have so many ideas and plans and lots of different ways that we're going to just keep bringing you that spooky content, man, in, in all facets. So. Thanks for for hanging with us and going along this crazy ride. But uh, before we kind of jump into this whole cult, uh, the other thing I want to remind everybody is we do have those new Lights Out hoodies. Uh, they're still available at lightsoutcast.shop. That is our new merch shop. I believe you can even uh, find them via our merch shelf, like right under our YouTube video. Um, I think that's uh, there's links there as well. So you can just pop over there and pick one up for yourself or maybe for... Uh, somebody else in your life that's a lights out fan you know yeah. it makes for a great holiday gift it's getting cold too and they're, cold. they're very comfortable and they're super thick so I've, I've been wearing them on these cold days i know i know it yeah they're heavyweight high quality it's got cool puff print on the front a whole uh screen print on the back of of our take on the cover art for lights out so yeah check it out support the show at lightsoutcast.shop but without further ado let us dive into the fucked up world of Lawrence Ray, or Larry, as he went by. But this guy is a natural born scumbag, and that's saying it nicely, I would say. <laughs> so, Mr. Larry Ray was born Lawrence Greco in 1959 in Brooklyn, New York. So, we did some digging on Mr. Lawrence, and uh, there wasn't a whole lot about his childhood available out there. And the only thing we do know is that. His parents divorced at some point in his life, and when his mother remarried, that's when he took his stepfather's last name, Ray. So that's how he went from Greco to Ray. After high school, he signed up for the Air Force, and surprisingly, he was only enlisted for a total of 19 days. And as you'll see throughout this, he makes a very big deal about his career in the military. Um, he hypes it up. He hypes it up big time. But despite only being in it for 19 days, he managed to schmooze a lot of higher ups, which included Marine generals, Charles Pittman and James Jones. Cause this guy, he, he's, he's definitely charming. He definitely knows how it's what to say and how to get in with people and make them like him. And so he was very good at talking himself up the ladder or up yes. the chain. And this is how he eventually got into a position in wall street in the 1980s. And on the side, he worked as a consultant for companies interested in construction, gambling, and insurance. In the 90s, Larry schmoozed enough people to eventually meet Bernard Carrick. Maybe you've heard that name before. Well, Bernard first worked as Rudy Giuliani's personal driver. And after finding a position in the NYPD, he later became the commissioner of the New York City Police Department. And he actually became nationally famous during the 9-11 attacks. When Larry first met Bernard, they quickly became best friends. Larry was even Bernard's best man at his wedding, and according to Bernard, they talked five times a day. Eventually, Bernard then introduced Larry to a special agent by the name of Gary Ewer over in the FBI. Larry told Gary that he had ties to the Gambino family and the Italian mafia, and this was how Larry became an informant for the FBI. So the FBI used him for information on a pump and dump stock scheme and he would meet with FBI agents several times a week. And it's believed that a lot of the information he was feeding them was just straight up fabricated. I mean, he's a very good liar. At one point, he even convinced the FBI that he was in life-threatening danger and the mafia had actually put out a hit on him. So the FBI installed a $10,000 security system at Larry's home. 
but eventually they discovered that he had been lying to them the entire time. And the only reason he was acting as an informant was to protect himself, of course. It's Larry above everybody else. Because guess what? It turns out that Larry was involved deeply in that pump and dump scheme. Which if you're not familiar with what pump and dump scheme is when it comes to Wall Street, it's basically when someone artificially inflates a stock price through false and deceiving statements and promotions so they can sell off their cheaply purchased stock at a much higher price. One of the best examples of this comes from none other than Jordan Belfer. Featured in the movie Wolf of Wall Street, he was famously involved in a pump and dump scheme with Penny Stock Brokerage in the 90s. Later on, Larry offered the FBI agents a $100,000 bribe. <laughs> like, that's going to work with the FBI, right? And of course, they're like, dude, are you serious right now? And he's like, yeah, I will give you $100,000 if we just kind of, you know, keep this quiet. The sheer confidence of this man is unparalleled. It's, it's just, it's mind blowing that he thinks that this was going to work. So obviously the FBI is like, are you trying to bribe us right now? <laughs> yeah. So they immediately charged him with securities fraud along with 19 other individuals. Larry then reached out to Bernard Carrick for a favor to get the charges dropped. Because he's like, oh, my buddy should be able to get me out of this. Bernard refused and said he didn't want to get his hands dirty. But around the same time, Bernard was also involved in eight felony charges, including tax fraud and lying to White House officials. He would later be sentenced to four years in prison, but he was later pardoned by President Donald Trump in 2020. Since Bernard wouldn't help him out, Larry was sentenced to five years probation. Any violation during this probation period would then result in him getting jail time. But ever since then, he felt that Bernard had betrayed him, and he began telling people that Bernard was in a grand conspiracy against him. I love this because it, it really just sets the scene. This guy is in deep with, he has mafia ties. He's the, with Bernard Carrick, the commissioner of the police department. And he's in so deep. And also, I love the fact it's like, you could really just sum it up. You're like, he's a, he's on Wall Street in the 80s. Yeah. He, he's, you're like, he's your Patrick Bateman <laughs> psychopath here, basically. But, uh, so if this will tell you anything about how convincing he is, how dirty he is, this is, this is it. While this was going on, Larry had been married to a woman named Teresa, but around the time of his conviction, his marriage had fallen apart. Larry was abusive, and he constantly cheated on his wife, which, shocker, are we all surprised by that? He was also abusive to his girlfriends, and rumors had spread that Larry forced his girlfriends to have sex with other men. So basically, already, like, sex trafficking at this point in his life. By 2004, Teresa filed for divorce, and during their marriage, they did have two daughters. One was named Talia, who was around 13 or 14 years old at the time, and Ava, who was around four years old. Throughout the divorce and his conviction, Larry had convinced outsiders that he was still this great guy. He also began to manipulate his young daughters, especially Talia. She and her father were extremely close, and he had convinced her that he was a great stand-up guy. And he began convincing Talia that her mother was an awful person, so basically turning her daughter against her own mother. And that's like classic 101 garbage divorce dad. Like it's if you're a parent and you go through a divorce and you try and turn your children against the other one, you're the bad guy. Right, right, right. not a good move. One day, Larry and Teresa got into a violent argument and at some point, Larry struck Teresa and then she called the police. But when the officers arrived, Larry convinced the officers that Teresa was the violent one. And they ended up believing Larry because when they asked Talia what had been going on, she stepped up and defended her father. Larry had manipulated his daughters to the point where they were convinced that Teresa and Teresa's father had sexually assaulted them. To fabricate the lie even more, Larry made several websites and published several open letters under Talia's name. He then added all the details of these fake abuse stories. On the night of the violent argument, officers forced Teresa to leave the home. Larry was then granted temporary custody of both of his daughters during the investigation. And when police questioned the daughters, Talia backed up everything her father had said. She even backed up all the allegations of abuse from her mother and grandfather. But when they questioned four-year-old Ava, she admitted that her father tried to convince her to say that her mother hurt her. During the investigation, Teresa's lawyers requested that Larry be given a psychological evaluation. 
This is my favorite Here's a part. quote from this report. This is wild. This man. sums it all up. It says, It is literally impossible to evaluate Mr. Ray in the usual clinical manner. His personality dynamics are so configured that he is able to manipulate and control almost any situation in which he finds himself, including a psychological interview with a forensic examiner. No matter how experienced that examiner may be, Mr. Ray is very good at what he does. It goes on to say, he can be utterly charming and one can be disarmed by his childlike simplicity and smile. But Mr. Ray is no child. He is a calculating, manipulative, and hostile man. That's that's wow. really all you need to know. That these, sums it up perfectly. These are, these are professionals through a psych eval, and they're saying this guy impossible to evaluate. We we this guy is so programmed to be a manipulator that he's just he's kind of just like convinced himself of what he is, and everything's a stage, and he's just a classic liar, basically. So if you think about what's to come and essentially kids that get wrapped up in this cult with him, I think someone's first thought with all this is like, how do they fall for this? But I think this statement coming from mental health professionals really gives you an idea of like, no, he's, he's that convincing. Yeah, he's dangerous. That anybody can fall victim to this man. And I mean, my God, he fooled Marine generals. I mean, I think that's saying something. If you're schmoozing with, I don't know, you're up there, Rudy Giuliani. Yeah. You're shaking hands with the mayor. You got Bernard Carrick, the police commissioner. Like he's got, I don't know, he's got ties and he knows how to get where he wants to go. Exactly. And he'll do it at whatever cost. Teresa was later awarded full custody of both of her daughters. And when Larry was ordered to release his daughters, he refused. He even started claiming that Bernard Carrick, Vice President Dick Cheney, and Rudy Giuliani were conspiring with Teresa to ruin him. Police ended up arresting him for contempt and interfering with custody. He was then sentenced to six months in jail. Ava went back to Teresa, but Tali refused to go back to her mother. Instead, she went to live in a youth shelter until her father was released. That's, that is crazy to think about too. Like She is that brainwashed by her dad against her mother yeah it's her mom that convinced and like granted her mother might not be the best mother we don't know that but we do know larry ray is a, a you know i'm sure she's better lender. than him yeah right exactly like, the very least so while larry was incarcerated he met a man named lee chen he then convinced lee of the big conspiracy against him and they formed a strong partnership behind bars and lee even offered larry a place to stay once his sentence was up Lee also had a short sentence of only a few months and he planned to return to live in his Manhattan apartment on the Upper East Side. And when Larry got out after six months, he stayed with Lee. They would talk into the late hours of the night and Talia came to live with him too. But it wasn't long before Larry had another run-in with the police. In 2006, he was caught trapping one of his girlfriends and trying to choke her. The charges were later dropped, but a year later it was determined that this was enough to count as a violation of his five-year probation. So police arrested him in Lee's apartment, and he was sentenced to three years in prison this time. Talia was actually in the room with him while he was arrested. Officers reported her screaming, quote, Police corruption. This is because of Mayor Rudy Giuliani and Bernard Herrick. So just literally recite. I mean, she's still very young at this point. Yeah. And she is just spouting all this stuff. I mean, I'm sure the officers are like, what is going on here? Yeah. How does she even know who these people are? Yeah. And like... It's the mayor? What? So yeah, I mean, this goes. This also goes to show. It's so sad that he's manipulated his own daughter. Yeah, to this point, which really goes to show, like, if he's willing to manipulate his teenage daughter into these grand conspiracies and stuff, you can only imagine how far he would manipulate someone that's not his own kin. Everybody's a potential victim. Yep. So Talia really believed in this grand conspiracy against her father and she would keep believing in it for years even when she headed off to college at sarah lawrence so sarah lawrence uh the private nonprofit college of sarah lawrence was founded in 1926 it sits on 44 acres of forest out in yonkers new york just near the village of bronxville 
It's about a 30 minute train ride northeast of Midtown Manhattan. And this is where she went to college. By summer 2010, Tali was going to be a sophomore the coming semester, and she found a large on-campus housing unit to live in. She pitched this idea to all of her friends that she had met in school that they should live here after summer break, and they all agreed. So come around fall semester starting, they moved in. Talia and seven other sophomore students were living in the Sloanham Woods on-campus housing unit towards roughly the center of campus. It's a massive housing unit, basically has living room, kitchenette, and then it's all attached multi-level to eight different bedrooms. After they all became roommates, they loved living in this unit. I mean, imagine living with like seven of your best friends. That's essentially what was going on here. They spent a lot of their time smoking weed, playing music, and fighting each other in Super Smash Brothers, which that literally sounds like my college I, say, I think literally everybody can relate to that. <laughs> yeah, because I was playing drums and playing Super Smash Bros. like every single weekend. And smoking a lot of weed, I bet. Smoking, yeah, back then, yeah. Not anymore. I'm sober. Danny, who was your main in Super Smash Brothers? Uh, Falcon. Yeah. Falcon? Captain Falcon. Did you ever get into Super Smash yeah, Bros? Yeah. Did definitely. you have a did you have a main or there's someone you liked? Uh, I liked Link a lot. Yeah. yeah. Link's classic. Link was a go to for sure. He's got that range. I always love Bowser too. Damn. Damn. Like to just smash heavy hitters. <laughs> yeah, the heavy hitters. Yeah. yeah. I I was also a Falcon main, but I would play DK, some Donkey Kong if I just wanted to smack people around a little bit. That's fair. That's fair. I the only one I don't respect is Kirby mains. <laughs> yeah. god and just i mean this is like flooding in memories for me just like being high on the couch playing super smash brothers with just dubstep music in the background <laughs> blaring like nice, yeah. just just like completely zonked out sometimes like how did i even graduate college yeah, like, that's right oh man that's good but yeah it seems like everyone kind of had that similar experience um if you went to college so well in, in like freshman year most colleges require you to live in the dorms like yeah. on like right on campus yes yeah. and then usually most colleges your sophomore year will allow you to uh, move off campus or move to other types of units like where they lived yep um that aren't like it's far enough away where you don't have to deal with like the campus police yes and it kind of feels like you're off on your own just living in a house somewhere yeah um so they really like that yeah and so this was technically on campus housing and i i lived i think my junior year i was technically in on campus apartment buildings which we had an ra which was weird we only ra kept, at the apartments yeah isn't that weird as hell uh i only saw him once i was like what do you even do here because we're all just we're yeah. like fucking what rules 20, are you 21 now so just make sure nobody dies yeah i guess but so I wonder if, I don't know, maybe they had some sort of possible RA since it was technically on campus, but I'm, I couldn't confirm that. This episode of Lights Out is brought to you by EveryPlate. EveryPlate is now owned by HelloFresh, which is a leading meal kit company. Sometimes I don't have time to grocery shop, so sometimes I just hit those fast meal places, get some takeout, but I'm like, man, the prices on that are pretty crazy. So check out America's Best Value Meal Kit. Their meals are 50% cheaper than your average fast casual meal, so it's time to ditch that takeout and save some money. If you're looking for a real deal, they're introducing the $1 steak for life, which is crazy. Add a 10 ounce ranch steak to your weekly order for just $1 per box. Every plate provides plenty of delicious variety, so you'll really never have to stress over what's for dinner. With 26 tasty and affordable recipes, and they rotate every week. That's my favorite part about every plate is sometimes I think it's going to get a little old and then they switch it up on you. It's easy to find something flavorful and satisfying for every meal of the day. They got breakfast 24-7, 15 minutes or less meals, feel-good food, and big batch faves. I swear every week there's a meal that I make and I'm like, this is like restaurant quality as far as like the flavor goes. Like there's never been a bland meal. Um, from from every plate and everything's pre-portioned when it arrives to your door which is super convenient it doesn't take up a bunch of room in your fridge you also eliminate so much food waste so every plate is the best meal kit and if you haven't taken advantage of this special offer then you need to right now get a meal for a dollar 49 plus one dollar steaks for life by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering the code 
49 lights out. Subscription must be active to qualify and redeem that $1 stake. So get started with every plate for just $1.49 per meal, plus that $1 stakes for life by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code 49 lights out. Remember, your subscription must be active to qualify and redeem that $1 stake. But anyways, the eight sophomores were Talia, Isabella, Dan, Claudia, Santos, Juliana, Gabe, and Max. We'll get through all them in a bit. Another friend and fellow student, her name was Raven Juarez. She was often over at the place pretty often, but she did not live there. But she'll be she'll be a pretty prevalent in this story. So Talia Ray was the oldest of the group. Some sources say she was around 20 or 21 at the time. I couldn't figure this There's out. There's like no information on her no, out there. She's been like scrubbed from the media, and I think that's intentional on her part. Uh, she has not been in the spotlight. The last noted time was 2020. So wow. she's probably changed her name by now, and she's just gone. But her goal at the time was to become a lawyer so she could help out people who were unjustly accused. And, of course, this stems from her dad feeding her all these yeah, lies. Like, about how him. much did he play a part in this? Exactly. But she was described by the others as driven, beautiful, and smart. She came across her boyfriend, Santos Rosario, their freshman year in a Roman lit class. He had asked her out after class one day, and they immediately had a connection. Santos will be a pretty important person in this cult, so I'll give you a little background information on Santos. He was originally from the Bronx, where he lived with his parents and two older sisters, Yalitza and Felicia. Both sisters will play a big part in this story a bit later, so keep them in mind as well. Yeah, there's a lot of names and people involved in this. Yeah, um, so we'll try to keep it as not confusing as possible because <laughs> there are a lot of people in this story. Santos grew up in a household where they didn't have much money. They had 10 people living in a basement apartment in the Bronx, and as Felicia described it, quote, every year there was chaos and some crisis. So he and his sisters had to work through high school to afford college, and he really struggled with his mental health in his teenage years, but luckily he was still able to achieve his goal of going to college. And fast forward to sophomore year, he's now living with all his friends in Slinham Woods, and really the college year was just getting started. They were having a ton of fun, but... Uh, that would change very quickly. Yeah. Because one day Talia called a house meeting and told everyone that her father, Larry Ray, was about to be released from prison. So mind you that her dad's getting out of prison and, you know, I, I can only imagine what they all thought initially about about Larry. You yeah. Know? And like, imagine someone calls a meeting and they're like, hey guys, so my dad's getting out of prison. You're like, where is this meeting going? I, I can't imagine. Plus, Talia always talked about her dad. So everybody was pretty familiar with him by this point. And, you know, she really loved him. She really looked up to him. And she'd always find ways to interject her dad into the conversations, even at drunken parties, which is definitely a little odd. I think I'd be like, dude, why are you talking about your of, dad so much? Yeah, it's kind of obsessive, right? Yeah. So the roommates pretty much felt like they knew him just by hearing all the stories that she would tell. And it was very obvious that Larry was her hero. She told everyone that Larry was a former Marine and once part of a CIA covert operation. She also claimed that Larry had personal connections with Mikhail Gorbachev. Reportedly, Larry had become close with Gorbachev's interpreter years earlier and was able to get a picture with him. He used this picture to impress the college students. Of course, Talia would also claim that Larry was wrongfully convicted for his crimes. She told them that it was all part of some grand conspiracy put together by her mother, Bernard Carrick, and of course, Rudy Giuliani. That September 2010, Larry showed up to the unit at Slinham Woods. At first, all the other sophomores were very creeped out by having this 50-year-old man crashing on their couch every night. I, I couldn't, man, if I was a sophomore in college and somebody's dad came to live with us, I would just be like, no. Nah, like, he goes or I go. Yeah, seriously. You can pay for my rent, like. So I, I imagine everyone was just super tight friends and they were like, hey, we'll just, you know, we'll kind of let this slide for a little bit. Maybe they felt a little sympathy for Talia and Larry. It's like, oh, he's getting out of prison. We know that the justice system doesn't really prop up ex-convicts, stuff like that. Maybe the, you know, this is all going through their heads. So they tolerated it for a little bit. 
I don't think I'd tolerate if it was like, oh yeah, my dad who's just getting out of prison is going to come crash at our place and be like, the fuck? Yep. But Larry did what Larry does best and he quickly won them over. He pulled his weight by cooking steak dinners, cleaning up the kitchen, and ordering pizza for everyone, which was obviously better than the campus food they had access to. It, it reminds me, like initially, this reminds me a lot of like a house mom or a sorority. Yes. Um, or I don't, I don't know if the fraternities have, I don't think the fraternities have anything like that. Yeah, no, the, like, I don't think no so. supervision, yeah. <laughs> no accountability. <laughs> they don't cook and they don't cook either. Yeah. It just, it's, yeah. it's a diet of beer and cigarettes. Exactly. So it kind of reminds me, he's kind of like the house dad. You know, yeah. Like, but I will say, man, I know I would be like, this is super awkward and I'm uncomfortable. But at the same time, food in college was, if you're getting free food, yeah, it helps. It's, that would be, that's how to convince a college student to start offering free food and steak dinners. Yeah. I might be able to deal with it a little bit easier if I was get, being fed real well. Right. And they also, just kind of got used to his stories and they didn't mind the fact that he always brought up his secret psyop missions against foreign leaders that he was once involved in just casually at the dinner table. Like, oh yeah, it was in a psyop mission. Or that he worked with NATO during the Kosovo crisis in the 90s. The roommates, you know, they cared about Talia and ultimately they didn't want to separate Talia from her dad. So they just put up with him. Raven later admitted that everyone was a little bit stoned all the time, which again, that makes the situation a little bit easier to deal with probably. Yeah. It was hard to tell if the situation was actually stranger than it felt, but Larry knew how to make it seem normal that he was there, and he knew how to make them laugh and fit in socially. After he gained the trust of everyone in the household, he started building the foundation for his future cult. One night, he called a house meeting with everyone, and he explained his personal philosophy to them. He called it Quest for Potential. Now, that's that'd be a weird thing. Yeah. It's like, all right, everybody, I want to tell you about my personal philosophy for life. Right. Also... God, if I, I'm in college, maybe I just had a full day of class and working and stuff, and I just want to get high and play Super Smash Bros. And somebody's dad, it's like another house yeah. meeting. Like, come on, but stop with yeah. this already. This is ridiculous. So Larry basically sold them on the idea that he could help anyone improve themselves. He promised them ultimate clarity and the ability to unlock their full potential and their true self. Boy, does that sound like a cult leader, right? Yeah. It, always, it seems to always start with self-improvement. Yeah. You know, it, it starts with trying to better people and, you know, seems like it's coming from a good place. And when I was 19, that was a very unstable point in my life. Right. So I would be open if someone's saying that I can unlock my true potential, I would be like, I'm a little lost. Can you help me pass my math class? Yeah, like, seriously. I'm, I'm close to failing out here. But Larry was really beginning to plant seeds with all the roommates and their true self was just clouded by repressed trauma from their childhoods. So now he's a mental health professional. As a new mentor, he offered them free counseling sessions where he claimed he could help them reclaim memories and build clarity. A lot of the 19 year old sophomores were impressionable and for college sophomores trying to figure out their futures and their place in the world, Larry's deal sounded pretty good. It started with Isabella Pollock. Isabella was from San Antonio, Texas, but wasn't that close with her family. Her mother was an alcoholic, but quit drinking when Isabella was seven years old, and her father wasn't around very much. By the time she was a teenager, her goal was to move out and become a doctor. She had met Talia Ray during their freshman year, and they quickly became best friends. Those who knew her described her as deeply insecure. She often hid away in her room and shielded her face with her hair and Larry used her insecurities to his advantage. He saw that she was open to his counseling, so he offered her one-on-one -on -one sessions, which is not creepy at all. After a while, another roommate, Dan, noticed that these one-on-one -on -one sessions with Larry went on for up to three hours on particular nights. Larry would just go on and on and on, and he could talk for hours, and his strategy was to wear his victims down so that they would begin agreeing with him. You ever meet someone like that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They just run their mouth, run their mouth until you're just like, yep, yep, yep. Just to like get them to shut up, like appease back. them. Yeah. But during these sessions, he started by convincing Isabella that her mother had treated her horribly. So isolating them from their parents, convincing them of exactly what he convinced Talia. Larry also convinced her through the reclaimed memory sessions that she had been abused by a family friend when she was young. After a few months of sessions, Larry began spending all night 
in Isabel's room. Probably imagine what was happening there. Well, they started having sex before Christmas break 2010. So obviously Isabella is legally of age, but this relationship I would say is still very inappropriate. Yes. Um, and it's really not exactly a consenting relationship because of what Larry's doing. He's taking advantage of his role and this counselor. And, yeah. And knowing within the context of Larry right. being this crazy manipulator. Yeah. It just, it's, it can't really be a consenting relationship. It's gross. Yeah. Honestly. Larry had manipulated her to the point where the relationship was fully controlled by Larry. A clear sign of this control is when Isabella canceled her plans to go home to San Antonio for Christmas break that year. Since Larry convinced her that her family had been abusive, Isabella planned to stay in Slonim Woods with Larry. So he and Isabella called her mom, Cindy, and broke the news to her that her daughter wasn't coming home. By now, Cindy knew who Larry was because Isabella had always mentioned him to her. She had never met him personally, but he was very convincing during the phone call. As a parent, I would be alarmed as shit if there was somebody's dad living with my daughter. And then speaking for her on yes. the telephone. Yes. Yeah. At one point, Larry interrupted and told Cindy that she was a terrible mother. And if she made Isabella go home, she would harm herself which Cindy was completely confused by what he was saying. And right after the call, she wanted to fly out to Sarah Lawrence to check on her daughter, but she didn't have any money to do so. So Cindy and the family thought giving Isabella space was the best thing to do. This was reportedly the last time Isabella spoke with her mother. After their conversation, Isabella's insecurity seemed to fade. She started gaining confidence and becoming more social. Santos described her as vibrant even. The roommates all noticed the change in her and they figured that Larry's quest for potential was really working. So some of the others considered joining in. This included Santos. Since his girlfriend Talia had talked very highly of her father, he thought he'd give a session a shot. Which I don't blame Santos at this point. Like no. at first I would be like, get this guy the hell out of here. But okay, now he's making his food. Now we can actually see a drastic improvement to one of our roommates. So I would... I don't know. I Maybe think, he knows what he's talking about. Yeah. So my mind would be changing at this point as well, I think, personally. I think I would too, to some extent, but I would still be very creeped out by the fact that he's spending all night in her room. Definitely. Yeah. I would be like, but again, it's, it's hard. It's easy for us to say this without actually being in it. And in hindsight, knowing who Larry Ray actually is. Yeah. But if we had no idea that he was a scumbag. Yeah. Then, well, and uh, I mean, uh, he was in prison. I would still he, be like, that, do you trust him? I don't know. Well, it's also, hard. but if you're really good friends with Talia and she's hyping up her dad and she's like, he was unjustly convicted, I promise, I swear that he's a great guy. But I, I want to challenge everybody out there listening as well. If you at this point, maybe you're like, oh yeah, this, I would never get caught in this. Maybe just try and put yourselves in the shoes of the victims here, because I don't think it's as simple as that. And I think it's hindsight is 2020 here. Definitely red flags going off for me personally, but. I, c I could see people getting sucked into this. Yeah, none of us have ever met Larry or yeah. been face to face with him. So it'd be very different if we were. Right. Or, you know, we might, you know, sometimes there's just those people that, you know, they're full of shit, but they just like, like damn, they could convince me of anything. And yeah. they just have that, yeah, that special skill set, I guess. For sure. One night, Santos joined Larry for his first session, and Santos talked about his family and the mental health issues he had been struggling with. And he admitted to self harm in high school. He also admitted he always felt closer to his sisters, Yelitsa and Felicia, than his own parents. His parents were from the Dominican Republic, and his mother worked a lot, and he suspected his father was constantly cheating on his mother. He thought there might have been deeper secrets, and their relationship confused Santos and often sent him into a depression. Knowing this, Larry saw how he could get Santos to push away from his parents, just like Isabella. Larry dug deep into Santos' family dynamics, and he convinced Santos that he was uncertain and that he had been abused by his parents when he was young. He told Santos that his father had sexually assaulted his sisters when they were young and he was also a drug dealer. And Santos fell right into his trap. He had been in therapy before, but no one had been able to connect with him like Larry. And especially since Larry's probably like he's finding out what the vulnerability is and he's exploiting that vulnerability. Yes. And he's exploiting those emotions and that deep trauma like it's super fucked up what he's doing. And he's exploiting memory. 
memory which it, which too. It essentially and distorting it yeah like well, oh no actually this happened which your memory is essentially your reality right so he's he's distorting these people's realities which is terrifying and just like isabella the quest for potential seemed to work on santos too the other roommates noticed he had gained more confidence and was all around happier and now he even idolized larry Next on Larry's list was Claudia Drury. Claudia was from California and she was really close friends with Raven Juarez, who didn't live at Slonim Woods, but often hung out there. Raven described Claudia as having a messy, chaotic artist brain. At first, Claudia thought Larry was just a straight up creep and she mentioned this to her friend Raven, but eventually Larry convinced her he was sort of a guru who could help her with her problems. During their sessions, they would talk for hours and Claudia opened up about her mental struggles and insecurities and fears. And like always, Larry convinced her that she had been abused by her parents. So there was one night where they're all hanging out, roommates are all smoking weed, and you know, they're passing around the joints or whatever. And it was it was kind of weird because Claudia, who usually partaked, passed this time around. And they're like, Well, why'd you you know, you're not gonna smoke with us? And she's like, Well, Larry said smoking weed is bad for someone who has schizophrenia. So Larry had effectively convinced her that she was schizophrenic um, based on his you know diagnosis i guess and this is a man with no yes psychiatric there, there's he has no reason to be doing this to someone yet he thinks he has the authority to right raven of course was like what the hell and tried to convince her that she was not schizophrenic but claudia told her that denying the problem was only making it worse and this damaged their relationship Raven watched as everyone who participated in one-on-ones with Larry defended him afterwards. They once saw him as a creepy man crashing in their house, but now many of them were becoming very loyal to him. After Larry got Claudia under his wing, he had one more target, Dan Levin. Dan was from New Jersey. He grew up with his parents and a brother who was 12 years older than him. Dan met Santos their freshman year and became good friends and roommates. And at the time, Dan was dating Raven Juarez. One day, Dan opened up to Santos about problems he was having with his girlfriend, Raven. So Santos suggested that he talk to Larry about it. He figured it was worth a shot since he had seen all of his friends improve after these one-on-one -on -one sessions with Larry. Dan and Larry met up at a coffee place in town, and Larry told Dan to put half and half in his coffee. And this was the first test. Dan quickly followed what Larry demanded. Adding half and half into his coffee was Dan's first acceptance that Larry knew what was right for him. He knew how to be an adult, so Dan needed to follow in his footsteps. Their first session lasted six hours. Dan was very open, and Larry took advantage of this. He told Dan that he was intelligent but insecure. Soon enough, Larry asked Dan about his sexuality. He even got Dan to talk about his genitals. In hindsight, Dan thought the meeting was uncomfortable, but at the time, he opened up about almost anything. He told Larry that he was questioning his sexuality and admitted to struggling with it for years. Larry told Dan that he knew for certain that he was not gay. Dan ended up believing him and he felt like a weight had been lifted off his shoulders. And he really just took Larry's words as fact. Toward the end of the session, Larry convinced Dan that Raven was holding him back from achieving clarity. Early on, Raven had been vocal about not liking Larry, so this was most likely a way for Larry to get Raven out of the picture, get her away from Dan. Soon after their session, Dan was led to a limo around the block, and inside of that limo was Talia, Santos, Claudia, and Isabella. So the cult is forming, and Dan joined them. Soon after, he ended things with Raven, and after that, she rarely came over to Slonim Woods any longer. So yeah, by now, I mean, this is it. This is, we've gotten the foundation here, and also Larry's so good at it that now he's even eliminating people that he thinks will taint what he's trying to build. So after recruiting Talia, Santos, Isabella, Dan, and Claudia, Larry moved back into Lee Chen's one-bedroom apartment in Manhattan. And he invited them all to move in with him rent-free for the summer. And honestly, for college students with no money, living on the 15th floor of an Upper East Side apartment for free? Not a I bad mean, deal. Yeah, it seems great. It's an awesome hookup. And Lee had agreed to this because he had kind of also become a victim in this quest for potential. And Larry named their group the Ray family. So now he's even considering them family. Yeah. It's not culty at all. Right. 
Larry and Isabella took the main bedroom. When the others asked why, Larry explained that Isabella was the most vulnerable, so she needed the most help, and everyone else was kept in the large living room, which, I mean, the layout of this, if you've ever seen like a New York apartment, they're very small. Yeah. Now, granted, this was a nice one, but even then, it's still a very small apartment building. Yeah, it's, I have family that live in Manhattan, actually. Yeah. And I've stayed at their apartment before, and I was like blown away. I was like, yeah. and they have like a really nice apartment, too. Yeah. And it's just, it's not very big. Um, even the tiny ones cost several thousand yeah. dollars a month, right? Yeah, it's crazy. So with them all under his control, Larry began taking over their lives and it got to the point where every morning at 7 a.m. sharp, he made them all get up and exercise together. Danny even described it as boot camp. Larry also became obsessed with getting everyone to express their masculinity and femininity more. Claudia began wearing makeup. He forced Dan and Santos to shave their heads. He also gave them bright colored polos to wear because this was a way to secure their masculinity. You can basically, you can wear bright colors. You can be a little bit effeminate because you're secure in your masculinity and your sexuality. He also started pushing the idea as a surprise to no one that we're all these just incredibly sexual beings who constantly want sex 24 seven, but society has oppressed our sexual behavior. And even in private, he would urge other members to be sexually attracted to each other and engage in sexual acts so they could quote, shed their inhibitions, not go out and find other partners, but within their group with yes, with each other. So I, to the members, it wasn't that strange at first and things were going relatively well in the Ray family for the first few weeks. Everyone felt uplifted and happy in this new community that they've built. And Santos even invited his sister, which I mentioned earlier, Yalitza. She came and visited them at the apartment. Now, Yalitza, she hadn't made any friends. She was over at Columbia University in New York. So when she came to the apartment, she was just fascinated by seeing a bunch of people living together in this tiny cramped apartment and they were just having a great time. So it kind of blew her mind. And as she spent time there with all those people who were getting along, she no longer felt isolated because of her depression, because she saw that everyone was just working through their own life struggles. And I think this was also the appeal of Larry Ray is that he got them all very vulnerable. And so they opened up that vulnerability so that everyone else would feel comfortable opening up that vulnerability. Meanwhile, Larry is using that to manipulate them all yeah they're all chess pieces to him yeah but really on their end of things it's kind of like this great thing that they could just talk it's about. a very unique situation that's for sure yeah so in the end she also ended up joining the ray family and she also stayed in the living room with the others meanwhile everyone kept going on with their everyday lives their junior year in college had just started and they went to class and worked their jobs so even from the outside, the Ray family was just, it was fully functional. But really at the end of the day, their experiences were always being controlled by Larry. They only went to class and went to work because Larry had allowed them to. And he also, during this time, he kept up those one-on-one -on -one sessions with everybody. So this was just a way to keep control and break them down even more. But now remember, not everyone who used to live at Slonim Woods moved into this apartment it's kind of fractured now even their old friends from Slonim woods they would try to reach out to these people but the ray family members would just they would bail on if they had a hangout session plan they would bail they would say they were busy and if any of them began spending too much time out of the apartment or having the slightest doubts about the cult larry would then drag these sessions out longer and longer to the point of exhaustion and this is his tactic. He would just drag it out and his victims would end up accepting everything that he said. He would convince them of false memories and reinforce the idea that their families and outsiders were against them. So to them, Larry became the only person in the world who truly cared about them. He was the only one they could trust. And once they all became dependent on him, this was when Larry knew he could kind of ramp up the intensity of his cult. Because at this point, you're like, what is Larry gaining from this? Like personally, obviously he's, 
you know, he's got Isabella, who's I guess his girlfriend at this point. But it's like other than that, what else is, is he gaining other than his egos being yeah. boosted? He gets off on control and mm-hmm. manipulation, it mm-hmm. seems like. That's a great point. I mean, later we'll see that he gets a little bit more out of it, uh, especially financially. But yeah, at this point. But he's really spending a lot of time to lay the groundwork and the foundation for his cult. Exactly. To be so that it, it builds in such a way where, you know, even if he has to, you know, have these long sessions and give all of his time to this, that ultimately he's he's got a plan. Yes. He knows it's going to build to this end goal where he's at the top of the pyramid essentially and he's just able to exploit everybody to no end as, yeah as you'll see and he yeah he proves this because he tries to push the limits even more especially this one night dan dan levin who we mentioned earlier he was sleeping in his boxers on the couch in the living room and that's where he was staying for most of the time almost everyone else was gone that night but Strange enough, Isabella came out of the main bedroom, sat down on the couch near him, and just out of nowhere made a move on him and began making out with Dan. Now, in that time, Dan was kind of suspicious that Larry had sent Isabella out there to hook up with him as some sort of test. And then afterwards, Dan was then invited into the main bedroom for the first time. And this was kind of like, which we'll see, Dan felt like this was... A moment of like i'm being accepted into something here he noticed that larry had started playing 13th century gregorian chants and said it was the best music to have sex to that's fucking weird weird as hell after larry coerced dan into a threesome larry began coaching him dan later said he felt like he was in a strange sex ed course where larry was the professor he said and isabella was his ta Dan felt like he had been brought into the royal court, so to speak. So as things kind of progressed in the bedroom, Dan saw Isabella had these really intense reactions to certain things, and they were more intense than anything that he had ever experienced. So he kind of figured in the back of his mind, there was something he could learn from this. And it was almost like Larry was teaching him how to be a man. Yeah, literally, Larry was giving sex pointers and yes, like he was literally like directly this is how you turn turn them on right and, you know, he was like oh, it's so disgusting to think about but very strange that's 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 what was going on and larry convinced the rest of his followers to start sleeping with each other he'd also encourage bringing strangers into the apartment and having sex with them up until now lee was basically the only one who wasn't really participating in all this Larry at some point tried to get Lee to join in on the sexual experiences. So one day he brought Lee into the bedroom and showed him two of the college students performing intercourse. And it's not really clear if Lee participated in anything in the apartment. But Larry once told him that he was building an army, which is concerning, right? Mm -hmm. And Lee was eventually so creeped out with the strange things going on in the apartment, he lost faith in Larry and soon moved out. The lease was still under his name, though, and it would take years before he could finally return to his apartment legally. Uh, There's, I'm like, why didn't he just go to the authorities at this point? Yeah. I I could kind of, I don't know, this is just me reading into it, but knowing Larry, I don't know, was he making certain threats? Mm -hmm. Was he going to, did he have some dirt on Lee that he said, I'll take this? So nothing's really clear why this happened the way it did but i can only imagine knowing larry that something's going on all the while larry was also popping adderall pills every day he rarely ate and he slept less than everyone else and it wasn't long before he began doling out adderall pills to the rest of the cult members he would basically split the pills and hand them out throughout the day he would tell them the pills would help them advance their journey to quote clarity so if you don't know adderall is in a Betamine that's commonly prescribed to treat ADHD and narcolepsy. It's a stimulant that's also heavily abused to increase productivity. If you've ever been to college, it is a rampant drug there. Knowing that it would keep people awake too, Larry would use this to deprive his followers of sleep. So when they were in this unguarded mental state, you'd just been taking Adderall all day, you haven't slept in 20 some hours, he would kind of use that and manipulate you even more. I assume this was his Adderall. 
prescription yes that he was he was getting and then doling it out to everybody yes and i'm sure that was a very calculated move on his part for sure to go with adderall sure seems like it to destroy their sense of reality he would coerce his followers into false confessions randomly larry would claim things in the apartment were damaged and everyone in the group could be accused except for talia and isabella but once he singled someone out he would pressure them into confessing and he promised that their confession was a step toward clarity even if they didn't do it they would still end up confessing after hours and hours of interrogations one example was when Larry wrote up a cleaning and organizing contract and made everyone clean the cluttered apartment. With so many people living in a one-bedroom apartment, the place was a mess, and there were so many things in the apartment, something was bound to get damaged. One day, Larry found hairline scratches in one of his kitchen pots, and he singled out Santos in front of everyone, claiming he had broken something. Santos denied at first, but after several hours of talking with Larry, he was worn down. Larry kept emphasizing this concept of being accountable for things that they've done. It was the only way to move forward and since the group fully trusted larry they would ultimately believe that they had done something wrong because why would larry lie to them so santos ended up confessing to destroying countless things at the property santos believed that his recent memories of destroying things had been repressed and larry convinced him to recall a false memory where he had intentionally broke things in the apartment over time larry had gotten into woodworking and they helped him move thousands of dollars worth of tools into this tiny apartment. Many of these were slightly damaged over the months and he convinced Santos to pay for the damages. And we're talking like saws. Yeah. Like big expensive like saws. power saws. Yeah, power saws. Yeah, they were that getting they would bring the, into the apartment. Which is insane. Santos then made a long list of the supposed damages, everything he could think of. After Larry looked over the list, he accused Santos of not being honest about what he had written down. He made Santos believe he had actually destroyed more things than what he had listed. So Santos went back to his list and it just got longer and longer. Santos ended up writing in everything he had ever come in contact with inside of that apartment. By the time his list was finally acceptable to Larry, the amount of damages totaled almost $48,000. So now Santos is indebted to Larry, which became an even deeper form of control. Because obviously 48 grand, I mean, that's a ton of money. Yeah, what college student has 48 grand? And Santos clearly didn't have the money. So what did he do? He reached out to his parents in desperation. But again, he had distanced himself from his parents ever since he was taken under Larry's wing. But his parents, of course, loved their son. So they gave him everything they could spare to help pay off their son's debt. His mother pawned what little jewelry she had and gave Santos $750. Santos then began asking all of his friends for thousands of dollars, including his old Slonem Woods roommates, but none of them could help him out. On top of all of this, Larry was convincing each of the followers that he had recently considered acts of self-harm. So throw that into the pot. Through manipulation and long-winded speeches, he convinced each of them that they were still on the verge of self-harm, and he was the only one protecting them. And we had mentioned earlier that what is Larry getting out of this? So now we're starting to see that there's a fiscal, yeah he's getting money um and i wonder if it was like this is what the plan always was or it just kind of was like as he went along he's like oh i'm gonna try this now and see if i can start getting money yeah that's a great point because it was never really super clear of what his intentions were in all this but i mean if at some point i mean we are they're living in this apartment essentially rent free because it's still under lee chen's name and this is larry's full-time job this is it. Basically, this is all he does. Controlling this group of college kids? Yeah. So he must have had to at some point been like, there. this can be a lucrative opportunity and I can start making money. Now, it's interesting though that he singles out one person in particular for 48 grand. Mm -hmm. um, but it's most likely because he saw he could manipulate Santos to a deeper degree than, than the others. But while the cult was getting more intense and abusive, an email, really strange email, was sent out from Claudia's email account. It was addressed to Sarah Lawrence's campus administration, including the dean and all of the people living in the Slonem Woods housing unit, or at least their previous roommates who were living there. It was titled just The Truth. In the email, Claudia admitted to talking poorly of Larry Ray on campus. She had called him a pervert, among other things, but 
This was her apology. She wanted to take back everything she had once said. She claimed Larry was an amazing person who saved her life. And there were more strange things like how Larry was innocent of his crimes. So when the email eventually reached her old friend Raven's inbox, she could kind of just immediately tell that this wasn't Claudia behind the words. She especially knew it wasn't Claudia because she wasn't the one bad-mouthing Larry on campus. It was Raven was the one that was bad-mouthing people, calling Larry a pervert and such. It was also obvious through the language and grammar that this was just Larry who used Claudia's email account to write this long-winded email. So Raven then reached out to Max, Gabe, and Juliana, who were the former Sloan and Woods roommates who were also worried about their friends. When they reached out to Claudia, she just said, hey, look, everything's fine. She said Larry Ray was the only reason she was alive. And this was basically the moment the friends could see that Larry had formed a cult. I mean, when you're saying things like the only reason I'm still alive is because of this individual, I think, yeah, that sets off alarm bells for, for anyone. Yeah. So obviously in hindsight, we could tell Larry had created a cult, you know, months and months earlier, but this was basically from the outsider's perspective from the friends who used to be close with them. This was basically the first moment. This email was like, okay, something really Our suspicions are, are true. Yeah. This is very bad. But keep in mind, this was, you know, a, almost a year or two after they had even met Larry. So a lot of things have progressed since then. But by 2013, the followers were basically, they were just in too deep. And they began to feel like it was them against the world, which is a very common sentiment in cults, right? Santos and Talia ended their relationship, but what's strange is that instead of Talia staying with her dad in the apartment, she was the one that left and Santos stayed behind. Talia went back to live on campus and she basically just disappeared. Uh, she didn't talk to her old friends at all. She was just gone. So we don't really know why she left. There might have been some incident. We have no idea, unfortunately, and Talia just has not spoken about this experience at all. I'm like so. so curious to know if she was like in on this plan right, or knew that this is what he was going to do. And maybe it got way beyond what she ever thought it would be or it was different from the way he described it initially. And she's like, all right, I'm just going to remove it. myself from this situation because this is, this is heading down a, a dark path. Yeah, I think that's a solid guess. But now with Talia gone, you know, Larry, there's no family involved here. So his abuse and manipulation got even worse. And it's not like he treated his daughter like a saint either. I mean, he was, he was ruthless to everyone, but now she did get some preferential treatment. Same with Isabella, but now with her gone, it was just going to the ramp up. So one night Larry put Santos through another interrogation session and of course, Santos ended up claiming things like he had been wearing a wire oh. and his parents were also in on a grand conspiracy with Bernard Carrick. The fact that he brought his parents into this. Right? Had nothing to do with this initially. Isn't that wild? Wow. So he believed Bernard had somehow reached out to his parents, which his parents are, they're just like blue collar. Yeah. The, they were living in a basement apartment in the Bronx. Why would Bernard Carrick ever reach out to them? But. Larry was so convincing that Santos believed this, and he even confessed that his parents paid him and Claudia to try and sabotage Larry from within. I I think like my hunch, this is all. Larry is an evil genius. He is he is like the puppet master, and he is trying to create a scenario where in his head he's like, if I can convince them that they've committed these crimes or a part of this grand conspiracy truly then when this all does go go bad because I, I just have to think like larry knew that there would probably be a point where this all it blows up right yeah and so he's like if i if i'm able to create dirt on, on everybody involved in this cult you know they can't turn against me exactly if if an investigation ensues because now they've convinced that they've committed these crimes even though they didn't do anything yeah you know? and it's just all made up i'm glad you brought that up because we will see how that does play into this towards the end for the longest time i had no idea what vitamins and supplements i should be taking and every time i go to the store and be like all right 
I'm gonna get my health right. I'm gonna get myself the vitamins I need. You go down the aisle and you're just completely lost. You don't know what to get. Do you just get the multivitamin? Do you get specific ones? Well, you don't have to do that anymore because Care Of has come through with a great service on many fronts. First of all, they have an online quiz that walks you through a bunch of different questions specific to you about your health goals, your lifestyle, and it gives you doctor-backed recommendations on exactly what vitamins and supplements you should be taking every day, which I really love. You get a doctor-backed recommendation, so you know it's not just, you know, pulled from out of nowhere and, you know, just made up or anything like that. This is exactly what you need. And what I love about Care of is that they give you a bunch of different recommendations. Like for me, I think I had 10 different ones from B complex to a probiotic blend, iron, vitamin D, ashwagandha, zinc, magnesium, fish oil. What's great about Care of is that they ship your vitamins in this really nice, neat box that just sits on your counter and they're all pre-packaged for that daily dose, which I absolutely love. And it makes traveling a breeze. You don't have to bring this huge organizer or anything. You just grab how many packets you need for how many days you're gone. And that has all of your vitamins for the day in it. It's very convenient. It makes it super easy and you can add, remove whenever you want to. You don't have to go with all of the different vitamins and supplements that they recommend. You can pick and choose, which I love. Another great aspect to care of is that it's a subscription service. So it just shows up at your door. You never run out. You never have to worry about reordering. It just shows up every month. Plus, care of's daily vitamin packs are made with plant-based compostable film to help limit the impact on the environment without compromising on the quality and safety of their product. Right now, you can get 50% off your first care of order by going to takecareof.com and enter code LIGHTSOUT50. Again, get 50% off your first care of order by going to takecareof.com and enter code LIGHTSOUT50. And yeah, he even got Claudia and Yalitza to also confess that, you know, this was all true. Larry ended up recording these interrogations and confessions that sometimes lasted until three or four in the morning using sleep deprivation tactics, you know, and he used that footage to blackmail them. So yeah, it's, it's a self-preservation tactic here, like you were saying. As for Isabella, she had become Larry's right-hand man and she did everything Larry told her to do. It even got to the point where Isabella began abusing the others. So even that control got to her head. Her relationship with Larry was described as this weird boyfriend-girlfriend, but also a father-daughter relationship, which is really strange. We know that she wasn't really close with her father. So she probably was in need of a father figure, so Larry kind of filled that void. But their relationship was strained when Felicia Rosario, Santos's older sister, who I mentioned earlier, she came to visit the apartment. So Felicia was a Harvard graduate and also attended Columbia Medical School. Keep, keep that in mind. She got a full ride scholarship to both. So incredibly smart, right? At the time, she was in the middle of her residency in psychiatry and she lived in LA, but she decided to head out to New York to visit her two siblings. When she flew in, they all went out to dinner and Larry also joined in and like any experienced manipulator, Larry immediately love bombed her with compliments and charms. She was also attracted to how Larry could talk about psychiatry with her, which is wild. This is, this is an incredibly educated woman who is in her residency of psychiatry. And she's even attracted to Larry like, wow, you know a lot about this. So he's either he's done his research to a degree or he's just an insane bullshitter, which maybe it's a little bit of both. But she always felt like she was learning something new with him. And she was so entranced that she even started dating Larry after they first met. Even when she flew back to LA, they kept up a long distance relationship and they talked almost every other day, sometimes every single day. Meanwhile, she worked 12 to 14 hour days during her residency. Her social life was basically non-existent and the only person she really talked to was Larry. So he's got her isolated. I'm sure he, he saw her as like, you'd be a great member of my cult. And he's just extracting as much information and using like reverse psychiatry. Yes. Against yeah, her. Seriously. You know, he's, he's, he's just that good at manipulation. Yes. He was so good at it that he got Felicia to fall in love with him long distance, which that's really hard to do with someone. And soon he started a programmer like the others. And by the end of her residency in LA, she didn't even finish her residency. Larry had slowly convinced her 
get this, that her parents and Bernard Carrick were in a conspiracy against him. So now he has all the siblings in on this. And now that she was dating Larry, he convinced her that she was in grave danger. It got to the point that she was so paranoid that she believed her parents were going to send men to sexually assault and kill her. So Larry told her she needed to get a one-way ticket to New York immediately. He was so persistent and aggressive that she agreed to move. And just before she finished her residency, they actually fired her because her life was such a mess. Larry then sent what he said was an FBI agent to pick her up and take her to the airport. And uh, probably that was a lie, right? It was just some schmo. But Felicia was officially Larry's girlfriend when she got to New York. In hindsight, her brother Santos now said that Felicia was basically, quote, like a shadow of her normal self. So he had essentially just mentally destroyed her before she got there. And on her first night in the apartment, she was allowed to sleep in the main bedroom, which even uh, Dan said was like the royal court. Right? If you got in there, you were in deep. You're in the inner circle. Yes. The circle of trust. Yeah. So here's the weird part is that Larry slept in the middle of the bed and Felicia and Isabella were on either side of him. All of them were naked as requested by Larry. Obviously, by this point, Isabella was feeling a bit betrayed once Felicia arrived. And Felicia was frustrated that there was another woman involved because I guarantee you Larry had probably convinced her that there was nobody else. But of course, they're just so entranced by him that they both play along with this. What gets even weirder is that Larry would sleep on his back and would force Isabella to cup his genitals the entire night. And he convinced Felicia that that's just how they slept. He convinced her it just wasn't a big deal. They also convinced Felicia that she had been sent by her parents and Bernard to sabotage him, which is what? Like, yeah, that's Larry, so crazy. To think Larry about. was the one that told her to come to New York, but now she's saying, no, you were sent here to sabotage me. And so all three of the Rosario children now believed in this really twisted conspiracy theory, and they were begging their parents to send them more money so they could pay off this fake debt to Larry. And here's what's really frustrating is their parents tried to go to the police, but they were told, hey, nothing can be done. All three of these kids are consenting adults, technically on paper. So we don't know. Well, how do you explain to the police that your kids are in a cult? Yeah. Sounds like a made up story, really. Right. They just tried to break it down within a 15 minute conversation with them. Right. So meanwhile, as all this is happening, Dan brought up his struggles with his own sexuality again and his doubts with Larry. Larry got so upset with him because he had already told Dan that, look, you're straight. Stop questioning me. So he ordered Isabella to get a dress from her closet and he forced Dan to wear the dress, walk down to the apartment's lobby and pick up the mail. When he got back to the apartment, Larry ordered everyone to gather around Dan. This gets a little dark here. He forced Dan to use one of Isabella's sex toys on himself while everyone watched, and apparently Larry also filmed this. I feel like that was the reason why he's like, blackmail. Yep. You know. Absolutely. Larry's abuse towards Santos and Dan escalated after this. Sometimes he would take a mallet and beat Santos's legs with it. And if Larry was frustrated enough, even Isabella would sometimes be subjected to his abuse, which is wild because she was kind of the one that was sacred. But even now, it's just getting worse and worse. Well, he's bringing violence into the equation now. Yeah. Which is making this 10 times worse. Yep. One night, it got even more worse when Larry thought Dan didn't believe in the conspiracy against him. So imagine if he, you know, he's confused. He has gotten this entire apartment to believe in this crazy conspiracy theory against him. And imagine being the odd man out in that. Imagine I'd be even scared. Imagine even just yeah. questioning it, right? Well, it seems like Larry's just straight up paranoid at this point. Yeah. It's almost I, I really think that Larry believes in the conspiracy himself. You think so? Like he's he's created this this fake little world that he's in, but I almost feel like Cause it's like either that or he's the greatest actor of all time true and but i almost feel like he's he's you know completely out of reality at this point yeah i mean if you think about it, he's in this apartment he's in this little world he's created he's telling everybody these things he's having these 
deep conversations about the, all these all these lies that I really think at this point he's believing his own lies, and because it's or he's just diabolical. Yeah, just, yeah. You know what I mean? Which maybe a little bit case. of both, at right, this rate. right? But yeah, that's a good point. Where I don't know if you want to tell a lie and convince everyone else of a lie. Probably believing it yourself first is like a big. Well, wouldn't that man. believing it in it yourself would make you even more convincing to those around you that very true you want to believe in it yeah that's a good point so yeah even if larry believes in this lie imagine being like hey i don't believe in this i the confidence that dan even has to just even go slightly against him is uh applaudable i'd I, say well and vocalize it too yeah right because i can only imagine that most of these people are at least having doubts and thoughts like i can't imagine that it's just like how you wouldn't yeah based on what you're observing and what you're taking part in like i think at some point you're like, you've got to be internally like what the fuck am i doing what is yeah. going on here something is very very wrong but then to actually vocalize that takes it a whole step further where you then run the risk of larry's wrath yeah which we'll see which he yeah he just continues to escalate things so basically, Larry, of course, could not have anyone in the apartment doubting him. So he grabbed a pair of pliers, clamped down on Dan's tongue, and began pulling and wrenching on it. And he even threatened to cut his tongue in half. Again, all on video, too. Yeah, this is on video. Uh, we're not going to play it here, but if, if you are morbidly curious, it is out there. He also began beating him with a mallet while filming it. And there's video footage of this torture happening. And it was filmed by Isabella. But at some point, Larry told Isabella to turn off the camera. Then Larry made, this is not uh, on video, but he made a length of rope out of saran wrap. He then curled up small balls of aluminum foil and folded them into the saran wrap rope. He then wrapped this around Dan's genitals and with a pencil, he twisted the rope tighter. So this is just torture mm -hmm. at this point. One night after the abuse, Dan went up to the rooftop and he climbed one of the water towers and he thought he had become a part of this thing that would just never end. So unfortunately, sadly, he did consider jumping off from the water tower and to end his life, but he did have this moment of clarity where he looked out over Manhattan and the lights at night and he thought it was beautiful and he was kind of reminded of this, that there are other things out here. This apartment is tiny. In the grand scheme of things, Larry Ray's control it's very small and limited so this was kind of the mental moment that dan broke free from this prison that larry had put him in he finally packed up his things and left he cut himself off from larry moved back to live on campus and when the others obviously they asked hey what happened to dan larry would just tell them that he had given up on quote gaining clarity and here's an interesting interview 2023 abc interview with dan talking about leaving the cult at what point did you feel, I have to leave? The violence towards me had really escalated and it reached a point where I, I did feel as if, if I stay any longer, I, I think I might die. It starts to feel like this might be a mortal threat, um, whether that's because he will kill me or I will kill myself and just so in pain. And you felt that both were viable options. Yes, yes, I would say so. God, terribly sad. But it backfired. Larry's, I, I think he maybe escalated this physical abuse to break Dan down even more. But it sent in, him over the edge. Yeah, and in the end, he was just like, screw this, I'm mm -hmm. out of here. So good for Dan. But by the spring of 2013, many of the followers graduated from Sarah Lawrence except Santos. He had been placed on medical leave, and Larry had broken him to the point of mental collapse. Some of the old roommates from Slonem Woods saw their old friends again on post-graduation booze cruise, but they noticed that the cult members mostly just kept to themselves, and this was the last time Raven saw her old friend Claudia. Larry then moved his cult to Pinehurst, North Carolina for a while. Santo stayed behind in the Manhattan apartment and found a job as a waiter. Of course, all of the earnings from their work went straight to Larry. The others moved into a large house on the property and the goal was to fix up the place for Larry's stepfather. So he put everyone to work for hours a day. They even had to shovel trenches in the pouring rain in order to divert the rainwater away from the house. 
They had to constantly move tools and boxes across the property or help them cut down trees. Many of them became overworked and sleep deprived. Larry also put a lock on the refrigerator claiming he kept it safe from strangers and he rationed their food even. Many of the followers started losing an alarming amount of weight and many of them, especially Felicia, began to have mental health issues. Meanwhile, Larry was still taking Adderall in large doses and on top of that, he would work with heavy machinery in the middle of the night. I'm talking like bulldozers, like yeah, no, serious. ears and all sorts yeah, of chainsaws. Yeah. yeah, it's wild. While everyone was forced into labor, Yelitsa and Felicia were at the bottom of the Colts totem pole and they were forced to sleep out on the front porch or in the garage some nights. Imagine that. Eventually, Felicia couldn't take it anymore. By now, she was experiencing a full mental breakdown and she began screaming and throwing tantrums like a child. Here's some video footage of Felicia in the new house. <laughs> I've been asking you to stop breaking stuff and stop hurting me and attacking me physically and you refuse. Get out of my garage. Get out. Get out of my garage. Please leave my garage. I've been asking you all morning. You've wasted two and a half hours. I love you, Larry. Stop. That's irrelevant. Yeah, yeah that's fine. That's good. That's good. Now stop. I love you, Phil. Well, then show me, dude. What you're doing is not loving. He's fine. Can I get a hug, please? No. Please. You need to respect other people's work. I don't want to. I want to. It doesn't matter. Please. Yes, it does matter. No, it matters that you want to. That's your choice. But the other person has to want to, too. I love you, too. No. And I love you, too. And I'll behave better now. Because I don't want Yali or Santa to see that. I want them to be happy, too. I want Yali to go to law school. And I want Yali to go to Columbia. Because I'm being angry. And for it's a... It's my child. It's my mother. It's wild. You know, I mean, that's a... I think that clip just explains so much yeah and you could tell she's even regressed to like she's acting like a little kid yeah because she's just been so mo mentally broken down by everything um and you could even tell in these videos if you look at earlier pictures of her later pictures of her you can see drastic weight loss yeah. just in this time period and she just doesn't she just doesn't look right other times you can even tell her face is puffy like potentially like I don't know if Larry is hitting her. But there's a lot of videos of people like hitting themselves mm -hmm. too. So yeah, it's just very sad all all around. These people just have been broken down to this childlike state. Meanwhile, Larry developed a strange wound on his leg that wouldn't heal. It looked like a rash or bug bites, and he used his wound as a reason to blame and abuse the others. He somehow connected the wound to a poisoning conspiracy against him. He mostly blames Yalitza for it. He convinced her that she was poisoning him for months. And like always, he broke her down until she confessed. She also confessed to poisoning her sister Felicia for two years, even though Felicia had been living in LA for some of that time, over two and a half thousand miles away. It just shows how brainwashed they are at this point. Yes. It's mind blowing. Yalitza also began to break down mentally after this, and she later admitted to trying to end her life while at the house. But one night she found the strength to finally leave. She didn't even bother to take anything with her. She put on her shoes, walked to the highway, and crossed it to hide from a potential search party. She described looking up at the stars and feeling a sense of relief, finally being away from that wretched house. She eventually made it all the way back to New York City, and while there she lived in supportive housing and tried to get back to a normal life. But it was going to be a long road since she had disconnected herself from her friends, her parents, and now her siblings. By 2015, the cult had been going on for about five years, and they eventually returned to New York City to live with Santos, and things basically went on as usual. Larry forced Felicia and Claudia to find strangers to lure them back to the apartment and have sex with them. Larry filmed everything like usual so he could use it as blackmail. On another day, Santos kept Felicia on the couch, and he told her that every time she made a noise, he would hit himself. So every time Felicia fussed and made a noise, Santos would slap himself really hard across the face to the point where his skin became very puffy and red. And every time he hit himself, Santos reminded Felicia that, quote, she was responsible for this. So really everyone's just, their mental state is degrading. A few weeks after this, Santos attempted suicide and Larry threatened to, quote, finish him off. 
After beating Santos with a hammer, he then urged Santos and Felicia to hold hands and jump out of the apartment window. We do have a little bit of audio from that day, which is evidence later used against Larry. Give me my hammer. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, 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 yeah, I swear I'll punch the story. Yeah, yeah. No, it makes sense. I'll punch you. I'll break your whole body. Yeah, I swear I will. I know. I'm going to get very simple. You just leap like a frog. Why are you going to hold hands? Jump together. No, so cute. That's work. Now how cute that would be if you both jump. Do you know how cute, how that cute would, would that be if you both jumped? Disgusting. On a separate occasion, Larry ordered Isabella to put diapers on Santos and Felicia because they were acting like children. And they were forced to stay in these diapers for hours at a time. Soon enough, Santos finally found the courage to leave the cult. When he was a few blocks away from the apartment, his sister Felicia called him crying and she was so scared of what Larry was going to do to her because she basically believed she would be blamed for Santos leaving. But Santos knew, he's like, I'm out of this apartment, I can't turn back now. He knew he had to keep going and leave, so he also ended up living in supportive housing and he spent a long time trying to deprogram himself. Even though Santos and his sister Yalitza had left the cult, they still struggled with what was real and what wasn't. Santos had completely lost his sense of time and said he felt like a ghost moving through the world. He and his sister struggled with what memories were real and which ones weren't, and they both struggled with trusting their parents again because Larry had instilled this idea that they were out to kill them. They had also cut ties with all their friends, so they basically felt like they had no support system once they left Larry. It took a long time to finally admit that they had been in a cult and their experience had essentially broken apart their entire family. Back at the apartment, the only people left at this point were Larry, Felicia, Claudia, and Isabella. And Felicia's mental health had also severely deteriorated. She would still throw tantrums, and Larry was caught on video tackling her to the floor. But Isabella was doing fine up to this point as Larry's assistant. She filmed most of what happened in the house, and here's an earlier interaction between Isabella and Felicia during that time that shows how Isabella, she's not, I mean, she has been manipulated and she is a victim, but we can also see how she kind of became an enforcer when Larry was not around. Excuse me. Change. Do not go in the room. I'm gonna go change. Do not go in the room. You know that. Do not go in the room. I want to go. Do change. not leave this room now. You went to the bathroom and washed your face. I want to go change my clothes. Like I'm just. I don't want to be in here. So excuse me. Do not leave it. Do not leave the room, Felicia. You're in danger to yourself and others. Not, clearly. Excuse Do me. not leave the room. Excuse me. Do I not leave the room. I gotta get. I Do gotta, not try to initiate physical contact. I'm not trying to initiate. Yes, you are. I'll go around you then. Stop it. I just want to get out. Just please, just leave me, just leave me alone for a little bit. No. Please. Stop. What? What's You're happening? unstable and you're violent. Stop. I'm not unstable. I'm not violent. You just assaulted me. I wasn't on purpose. But you assaulted I me. I didn't. It wasn't on purpose. Sit down. I'm telling you what makes me feel comfortable, the person you assaulted. I'm sorry. And you're intentionally disregarding it. You're intentionally not doing it. I wasn't trying to. You are to behaving like a criminal right now. That is, she learned all that from Larry. Oh, yeah. Those are the same tactics. Uh, you're a danger to yourself and others. You're, you're acting a criminal. like a criminal. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's, she definitely learned that from Larry. As for Claudia, Larry had convinced her she owed him thousands of dollars for property damage and she had joined the conspiracy against him. He filmed her confessing that her mother provided her with poison and that she had been poisoning Larry and her old roommates in Slenham Woods multiple times throughout the years. Here's a little snippet of that confession video. And first, are you making this by your own free will? Yes. Anybody pay you? No. Anybody threaten you? No. Anybody coerce you? No. Okay. 
Like that's going to hold up. You want right. to make this because of what? Because I just want to make it. I just want to talk, talk about it. Tell the truth. Why? Because it's destroying me not to. Okay. So is that what you said before? You said a few, well, few minutes before we started recording this that you feel bad. Is that true or not? It's true. Okay, so when did you poison last? Let's start with Columbia Hospital. Tell me all about that. You told me about that a minute ago. Let's go. You've been in the hospital. When? The summer, late July or August. In the summer, I was at Columbia already. Um, you, I came up and saw you four times, I think. Was it that many? Yeah. And what hospital was it? Columbia at 168. Columbia what? Presbyterian. In what city? In New York City. On the 168th Street campus. What month and what year? It was, I think, August in 2014. I came up and saw you four times. I brought poison each time. What did you bring? Cyanide and arsenic. I brought vial each each time. And you poisoned me? Yes. You said? Yes. And where'd you put it? I put it in your food. I put it on your back. I put it in your shoes. I put it on your handles where you would touch in the bed. Put it in the bathroom where you would touch hers. Doesn't it look like she's about to fall asleep that whole time? Yeah, too? she's like Maybe rolling her eyes too. Yeah. Like she's like it's like very late in the night, probably when they're recording this. But how is this not coursed? Oh, so like obvious. that is the definition of a course yeah. interrogation or interview. Yeah, it's it's crazy how much he's broken them down to. I'm saying this. I wild. think at this point too, Larry is just I'm mean, out of his mind. Yeah, like I sure. think he's lost it too. He's gotten in so deep that he's just he's so delusional. He's also while this is happening, a lot of it is he still has these like rashes on his leg and that's where the poisoning connection comes from. He's like, if this is here, someone has to be poisoning me. So he's like feeding into his own paranormal paranoia and he's convincing everyone else of this paranoia, but not only just convincing them of that, they're also the ones causing this to happen even though he's probably causing it to himself right is my guess or that apartment's just so damn filthy that who knows what kind of infestation of bugs or yeah bacteria like a fungal rash or something right right so larry then used this footage as blackmail to force claudia into prostitution claudia ended up working for a bdsm escort service and when she got enough clients she started her own business and charged a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars per hour Most of the money went to Larry and Isabella. To maintain control over her, Larry threatened her with posting videos and pictures of her handwritten confession online. Claudia began working countless hours to pay Larry back, and Isabella would pick up thousands of dollars in cash and return it to Larry. She wrote it down in a notebook every time she picked up and transferred money, the date and how much. Sometimes she would take the money for herself and buy expensive clothing, lingerie, makeup, and high-end hotels. If there wasn't enough money coming in from Claudia's end, Larry would get violent, and he always threatened to launch the website with the confession videos on it. Meanwhile, Claudia ended up getting close to one of her clients, and she told them about what was going on. Somehow, Larry found out, so he tracked her down to a hotel in Manhattan. According to Claudia, he tortured her for seven hours straight. Isabella filmed and assisted the entire time. Larry tied her naked to a chair and suffocated her with a plastic bag several times. He doused her in freezing cold water in front of the hotel's air conditioning unit. He also cut off her hair, smothered her with a pillow, and choked her with a leash. By the end of the night, Claudia was convinced she was going to die. Luckily, she survived, but Larry was so angry with her that he made the blackmail website public, and he sent it to all the roommates who lived at Sloanham Woods. 
And like you were saying, it's so obvious to see that this is coerced. So many of the roommates were super confused when they got the link to this website and watched the video. They knew they hadn't, there wasn't a poisoning. They hadn't been poisoned because he had also got her to admit that she had been poisoning their roommates for, for years as well. And they're like, we would know if we were poisoned. Yeah, right? she's talking about serious poisons that yeah. would kill people. Yeah, mercury, mercury, arsenic, something else. Cyanide, cyanide, yeah. cyanide as well. Like all that stuff's deadly. Yeah, so you would know if you were being poisoned. Yeah. So that's all the rumors are like, this is bogus, clearly. Everybody would be in the hospital or dead. Right. If Ex they were truly being poisoned by exactly. these samples. So some of them looked into the website and they actually found a phone number that connected them to a website. So they Googled it. It connected them to a Twitter page for an escort service. And this is how they found Claudia here. She had all of her prices listed, photos of herself. And her old friend Raven and the other roommates obviously became concerned. Not only is she saying that she's been poisoning all of them, she's now working in this prostitution ring. They thought they could maybe act like a client, set up a meeting with her just to talk and figure out what the hell is going on. But they figured that wouldn't be a good Leave it to the professionals at this point. Right. So instead, and another frustrating aspect of this case, they went to detectives, even ones who specialized in sex trafficking at the Department of Homeland Security to see if they could help. Max was the one that was sent in to talk to the detectives, but he was essentially as... He says he was laughed out of the room. They told him it was just too far fetched. This story is too crazy and there's nothing that could be done. So I know, isn't that so frustrating? I would love to know the individual that he talked to because that person should lose their job. A hundred percent. Oh my God. Yeah, seriously, name names here because this is ridiculous. Not, so not only have the Rosario parents gone yeah. to police, now we have an old roommate try, to, speaking directly to the, the Department of Homeland Security. And they're not even doing anything. So I love that they didn't stop here. They realized that since authorities wouldn't do anything, they reached out to a man they knew named Ezra Marcus. And some of the roommates had met him through Sarah Lawrence at the time that they were there. And they knew he was a freelance writer. So if the police weren't going to do anything, if the Department of Homeland Security wasn't going to do anything, they would take the story to the public by having Ezra write an expose on Larry's cult. I love this. Super smart. Yeah, it's awesome. So Ezra also had ties to New York Magazine and one of the writers there, whose name was James Walsh. Together, they put together the entire story as much as they could figure out on Larry Ray and his cult. Obviously, this is years after the fact, and it, it actually wasn't published until April of 2019. That's when their expose was featured in New York Magazine. Now, this eventually got to everybody, right? It was a huge news and everyone was involved in this. And when Claudia read the article, she was finally able to see what was going on. Everything kind of just, she had a moment of clarity when she read through all this and she was kind of finally ready to escape Larry's clutches. She became close enough with some of her clients and they even helped her out. They gave her enough money to get a train ticket out of, out of the town and to all the way to Philadelphia, which is wild because remember her rates? It yeah, was like a thousand fifteen thousand fifteen hundred. She couldn't afford a train ticket because all, all of that money was going to Isabella. And exactly, Larry. unreal. It's estimated that over four years, Claudia had given Larry Ray over two point five million dollars. Wrap your head around that. That that is so much money, and so much work that she's doing. Right? Like holy shit. Honestly, but man. That just shows you how Larry just knew how to play these terrifying manipulator cards. And on top of that, too, the Rosario's parents had sold their house and the family car. And they had also given Larry pretty much everything they had, which was estimated to be between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars and $300,000. Wow. So when the New York Magazine story finally broke, it made national headlines, obviously. And now the FBI finally gets involved because they're like, holy shit. How was this right under our noses and we didn't do anything about yep. it? Yep. Or know about this. Or right. They probably did. But yeah, they might have just shrugged it off as well. So by now, Larry, Felicia, and Isabella had moved to a new home in New Jersey owned by a friend of Larry's. They were forced out of the New York apartment because Lee Chin finally won it back after countless legal battles. I guess 
was what was going on with that apartment. They couldn't get them out. And, you know, it gets weird with squatters' rights and Yeah, there, or there's some weird lease agreement or yeah. something between Larry and him. I don't know. So it took a long time, but they were finally kicked out of that apartment after years of being there. As for Larry, the FBI raided his new home. Larry was finally arrested in February 2020 in New Jersey. Felicia and Isabella were also arrested in the indictment, but later released. Larry luckily was denied bail and held until his trial. He was charged with 17 crimes, including violent assault, racketeering, and trafficking, and he potentially faced life in prison. Here's a clip of the law enforcement press statement made after Larry was arrested and charged. For so many of us and our children, college is supposed to be a time of self-discovery and newfound independence, a chance to explore and learn all within the safety of a college community. But as alleged, the defendant exploited that vulnerable time in these victims' lives through a course of conduct that shocks the conscience. Protecting our community from those who prey on children and vulnerable young adults has been and remains a priority for our office, and we will continue to do everything we can to seek justice for raised victims. So before the trial started, the Hulu documentary team behind the docuseries Stolen Youth that we mentioned before interviewed Felicia and Isabella back at the New Jersey home. Felicia was shown saying how much she loved Larry and considered him her husband, even though they weren't legally married. She's like, well, we're common law married, so it's basically the same thing, which it's really not. Yep. While laughing, she said, quote, he's the best. I don't care what people say. They don't know him. I do. Both her and Isabella denied the allegations against Larry and Felicia still believe they were victims of poisoning by their family members. Soon after the interview, they both moved out of the house. Isabella was faced with two options. She could cooperate with the prosecution and testify against Larry, or she could face co-conspirator charges and potentially face prison time. Meanwhile, Felicia struggled with understanding the truth and what was real, just like her siblings. As much as she wanted to reach out to her family, she still believed they had tried to poison her, and she thought that speaking to them would be a betrayal to Larry. But with the time away from Larry, she eventually recognized the lies she had been fed, and she called the false stories in her mind, quote, Larry Brain. Over time, she could see what was real and reconnect with her family, which I guess is a positive to come out of this, is that she reconnected with them. Because of COVID-19, Larry's trial was delayed until 2022, which was 12 years after Larry first moved into Slonim Woods. The trial lasted about four weeks, and all the Rosario siblings testified against him, but the most important testimony was from Claudia. In detail, she recounted the four years of sex work that she'd been forced into by Larry. She also gave a detailed testimony about the night she was tortured for seven hours straight. Meanwhile, Larry faked several seizures to disrupt the trial process. He kept up the theory that he was being poisoned for years, and that's why he was having seizures. In the middle of Claudia's testimony, guess what? Larry faked another seizure, and the trial had to stop. Those who knew Larry knew he was faking it, but this was his last-ditch effort to have control over what was happening. The biggest irony of the case was that all the interrogation and confession footage that Larry had used as blackmail against his followers was now used against his ass in court. It See, was yeah. This is where I disagree a little bit. I do think Larry is a, a genius when it comes to manipulation, but clearly he was not a genius no. because what a dumb move. He filmed all of his crimes. I think I think he slipped into madness at some point. Yeah. Yeah, I believe that. Or he was just fucking mad the whole time. I mean, it's really hard to tell with him. True. It was also revealed during the trial that Larry had been diagnosed, <laughs> finally, with yeah. narcissistic personality disorder, which... Not a surprise. Yeah, right? no surprise there. By the end of the trial, on April 6, 2022, 62-year-old Larry Ray was found guilty of 15 out of the 17 charges against him. Two charges were dropped for technical reasons. He used violence, threats, and psychological abuse to try to control and destroy their lives, said U.S. Attorney Damian Williams. He exploited them. He terrorized them. He tortured them. Let me be very clear, he said. Larry Ray is a predator, an evil man who did evil things, end quote. On January 20th, 2023, so beginning of this year, Larry was sentenced to 60 years in prison without the chance of parole. He's going to die 
in prison. Oh, 100%. Yeah. As he should. Throughout the trial, Isabella Pollock remains loyal to Larry, and she still believed in that grand conspiracy against him. She was arrested on January 29th, 2021, and charged as she should be with extortion, sex trafficking, racketeering, and money laundering. Her own defense attorneys questioned her competency to stand trial because they thought she was so programmed that she wouldn't assist her attorneys in her own defense. She ended up finding a new attorney and taking a plea deal. She pled guilty to one count of conspiracy. She was later given a chance to make a public statement and she finally denounced Larry for the first time. Through sobs, she said, quote, I believed in supporting someone who had controlled me in ways I could not understand. I will live with the guilt forever. I'm ashamed and deeply regret it. I'm truly sorry. The judge took this into account, you know, that Isabella was under psychological duress while committing her crimes, which I think you have to agree yeah, with. She's also a victim to some degree. Mm -hmm. But in the end, she was a key instrument that Larry used in order to control the group. And on February 22nd, 2023, the judge sentenced her to four and a half years in prison. As for the Rosario siblings, Santos, Felicia, and Yulisa, they reconnected with each other and their parents. When Santos was asked about that time in his life, he said, quote, the memories are pale. We're talking about a very different Santos with a completely different path. As of this year, Santos has found a new job and lives with his parents again. Yulisa graduated from Columbia University and is pursuing a career in the arts. Felicia now works as a management consultant and she hopes to return to the field medicine one day years after leaving the cult felicia said she could still feel the conditioning that larry subjected her to here's a 2023 interview where she briefly talks about those moments and how she now sees herself in those old videos what were you feeling in that moment i don't remember i blocked it out and there's there's so many holes in my memory but it's hard for me to watch like wow, that's horrible what he's doing to her, but it's, it's she, not me. At what point did you decide enough? Um, I didn't. The FBI came. <laughs> the FBI came and arrested him, thankfully. It took them coming to get him for me to be able to even consider having um, a life again. Here's another interview she did on MSNBC where she talks a little bit more about how she became Larry's victim. How is it that a grown woman, a mature woman like mm -hmm. yourself, allows yourself to slowly slide into being a captive? That's a great question. Um, and it's a question that I'm still asking myself, how, how this happened, um, because yeah, it, it is. It, it's looking back now. I could. I would still say. I would still ask what you're asking. Um, how could it be? But Larry's so skilled. Um, you know, like how could he? How could Bernard Carrick let him be best man at his wedding? How could Gorbachev let himself be? You know, led around America by. <laughs> What? By Larry. Yeah, he, yes. Um, so. You're and kidding. He, no, I'm not. And he, I mean, there are pictures, there's like letters and he know he knows a lot of people in a lot of, a lot of influential people in a lot of places, lawyers, police officers, like all kinds of people in the military. So, you know, it's. If he's if he's able to get in with people like that, like, and then he decides to target me, yeah, what chance did I have, really? Like, I'm not gonna know better than like you know a f the former head of the KGB or the former police commissioner. That's a really good point. She yeah, up. that's one of my favorite interviews with her. Cause yeah, it's like, what chance did I have? This guy is schmoozing everybody on the planet here. I'm just, she's like, I'm just a it's in my residency, I just graduated college, like I didn't have a chance. So it's like everybody who came in contact with Larry was a victim to to you know different extents, obviously. Yeah, yeah. But at least fooled right. by him. And it, I also love that other interview where she's like, 
when did you find the courage to walk away? She's like, I didn't. It was the FBI finally came. And that's what started to release me from this prison that I had been put in. And I think that's a, also a really great point because she's essentially admitting if the FBI never got involved, if this wasn't exposed, she would still be locked in. Yeah, yeah. And just the fact, I mean, he has all these contacts in law enforcement and the military, and yet this went, flew under the radar for so long. Yeah. It just feels like this should not have gone on as long as it did. No. And it's just the fact that the, it started on a college campus, and yet the college didn't even know. It seems like the college the extent of what was them. going on. Yeah. And the college failed them. You know, you pay to live on campus with the expectation of safety and that did not happen at all so mr dan levin in 2021 went on to publish a book about the cult titled slonem woods nine a memoir and he says it helped him move on in his personal life he also received a master's degree and his goal is to help others take their most difficult memories and turn them into memoirs he also wants to push recovery into the spotlight since the narratives of these types of stories are often centered around the abuse, which I really love. Yeah. And as for Claudia Drury, she tried to get out of the spotlight after the trial. She has also reportedly reconnected with her family, which is always great to hear. As of 2020, Talia Ray was living in North Carolina. She had found work as a paralegal at the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. She has also stayed out of the public spotlight and has not commented on her father. During Larry's trial, she was referred to as his co-conspirator. She could be heard on audio recordings threatening Santos and calling him a violent criminal for destroying her father's property, but no charges were brought against her. As for the college, there we go. Sarah Lawrence, they released a public statement on the situation. Their statement reads, The acts charged in the indictment allegedly started in 2011 after Ray had stayed with his daughter. They spent nearly a decade and are not alleged to have taken place on the Sarah Lawrence campus, which that's a total, you know, it's not us. They're we're like, we're not responsible. Technically, yeah. the crimes didn't happen on the campus, but right. it's like, what, no, what the cult started on yeah. the campus. Like, come on. That makes the acts as alleged no less horrific, nor a heartache for the victims of those misdeeds any less deep. But it is important to reiterate that the crimes for which this man has been indicted did not occur at Sarah Lawrence, which I feel like this is their lawyers yeah, talking here. So we don't have any responsibility. No. Even though he appears to have met certain of his victims while they are students here. So they'll admit that he met yeah. his victims here, but that's it. That's as far as it goes. They also said, while after thorough investigation, the college uncovered no reports or complaints from 2010 that Ray was living or sleeping in his daughter's campus residence. The subsequent accounts of former students indicate that he was, which pff, sounds like, oh, we didn't know. What are we supposed to do about it? Right. Yeah. Pretty weak. I mean, I understand to some extent that the crimes, you know, were in the out apartment, but we don't know that for sure either. Right. Like, yeah. Who knows what was actually going on in the campus? It's a great house. Point. But man, it's like, come on, you guys. This is on campus housing. This is. Uh, I don't want to say jurisdiction, but I feel like anything that is occurring on your campus is the responsibility of the college, right? Absolutely. And they should be held responsible for that. And how are you going to prevent this from happening again? Right. You know, like there's got to be, be something they can do about this. But I guess, I mean, as horrible as all this was, I'm. It's kind of a happy ending to some degree. The best that I can be. Yeah. I mean, obviously the abuse is is horrific and the trauma they went through and brainwashing they went through is is terrible but i'm glad that they're all seemingly being been able to move on you yeah know, and, and re get their lives their, back and yeah their freedom back and and that the man responsible is right where he should be right i love how felicia called it larry brain mm -hmm. to compartmentalize what he had been feeding them versus what was actual reality I also found it really interesting that she also kind of talked about herself from the third person perspective. Like that's when she's watching old videos of herself, she's like, that's not me. That's somebody else entirely. That was when I was programmed and I don't even see that as who I was at the time, which I think is, it's 
I don't know, everyone's kind of got to go through their own journey of recovering from something like this. But I know deprogramming is a, is a major thing in cults. And I think it's, I don't know, I think we've looked at deprogramming differently now than, you know, cults way back in like the seventies and stuff. I think we're a bit more sensitive to how things like this happen yeah, and uh, how to undo it, so to speak. But I think this also really just shows that anybody can fall victim to a cult. Yes. And despite what you may think about yourself or, you know, oh, I would never fall for this or I would have seen the red flags here. But it's like, I think this, this very story shows that anybody, you know, if you come in contact with, with that person, and it just, it also shows that there's these people are everywhere. I mean, there's, you know, I, I think sometimes people think, oh, you know, cults are a thing of the past, and no, you know, it's yeah. and and it maybe maybe it's not like oh, we live on this giant compound and yeah, in it's the not middle the of old the jungle or cult. something, you know. Yeah. What I mean? But this is like a modern, I guess, a modern take on a cult, where it could just be happening right under your noses, and you have no idea that this is going on. Yeah, and it's just a reminder to me that. I don't know. You're just, you're technically an adult when you're 18, but you're really, you're really not. I really don't know shit. When I was 18, I, I was stupid as hell. I still felt like I was, I was just a grown kid essentially at that age. And I think Larry exploited that Mm -hmm. and knew that from the very beginning. I think it's, I'm just so curious to know more, like get inside Larry's brain and like, know what, what was the plan here? Like, where did this start? why'd you do this and what what was the end goal of this or he, or did he know that this was gonna this was eventually going to run out and you know he got all this blackmail and convinced them all that they had committed crimes against him he's like well it's kind of like the suicide pact in a way it's like if i go down everybody goes down for sure and he kind of used that philosophy against all of them yeah he's got that kill switch which backs the ultimate on control him, but yeah, yeah ultimate control tactic but yeah ultimately it backfired on him and he's really the only one that ended up losing everything yeah because i mean oh oh, this is i wanted to ask you this when isabella was saying things you know she was able to make that last statement about larry and we know that she had backed him up for a very long time but she made that statement where it was like i had just been convinced by this guy and i'll live in regret forever um, were you convinced by that? Do you think that's just her lawyers being like, look, you have to say this or you're screwed? Do you think there's a part of Isabella who's still I think there's a part, him? yeah. I, I don't know how you could ride so hard for him and then just like throw it all away. Yeah. And again, her relationship with him was completely different from everybody it, else's. Yeah, it seems like hers was way heightened compared to the others. And she was benefiting off of what they were doing. Right. She was benefiting off the money that Claudia was bringing in. So... I, I think it's, I mean, it's hard to say for sure, but I think part of it, I think part of her still probably cares for, for him yeah. despite everything. Cause I think out of everyone, I think her and Felicia were probably the most programmed. But that's the thing too, is I do feel like it's hard to even say that because Larry preyed on her at, at so early on and got yeah, in, she was, got, got in. That's a good point. I forgot she was the first one. Yeah. Got in like deep with her physically, emotionally. And yeah, I, I, I think it's I think it's hard to even say that. I think there is a potential that she does truly regret all this and and she just was in so so deep into the lion's den. She just she didn't do nothing else. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's I think it's always hard with Colts because you just you know, we're just outside of it you know we don't know what it's like and yeah it's hard to put yourselves in the the shoes of these people it's it's hard to wrap your head around how this can escalate to this point but luckily glad scumbags in prison yeah luckily for the rest of his life he's in prison and luckily you know honestly no fatalities in this case which is a rarity here on lights out but um i'm glad that we were all make it but I'm, i'm glad that all the victims are you know trying to move on with their lives yeah he learned from horrible horrible chapter of their life so yeah we want to know your thoughts on this though what do you what do you i really want to know 
do you think this was Larry's plan the whole time? Yeah. Or did Larry make moves in one direction and then just got so deep into it that he just kind of was like flying by the seat of his pants. Fuck it. Yeah. I'm just going to go as hard and, and far as I possibly can with this for my own benefit that I know it's all going to blow up one day. I'm just going to ride this out. Or did he have, you know, a master plan and had they not gotten, you know, that magazine article put out there and the FBI came in, how far would the, have this gone? Yeah. Would he have expanded this cult? Would he have, it seems like he was going that direction. I mean, he moved out to North Carolina. He's got this house. He's got this land. It's almost like, I feel like he's got the compound going. He's yeah. building that traditional compound. And the fact that he calls it Ray family, I wonder if there's any inspiration from the Manson family with this. Yeah. I wonder, I feel like Ray's got to have some inspiration for this, this cult for sure coming from elsewhere. Unfortunately, I don't know if we'll ever know the truth because even if we were to interview Larry, you think he's going to give us a straight answer of what he was thinking then? I think he would bullshit his way. Probably. Yeah. And I, I don't think we'll ever really understand what's going on inside his head, but yeah, that's a good question for the, the audience. I don't know. Danny, what do you think? Do you feel like he had a plan this whole time? No, I don't think he had a plan. I think once he got out of prison, his first goal was just, I need to find a place to stay. And then it just kind of escalated from there. And then once he really got his hooks into the, the kids, he just kind of on the fly adapted it and tried to suck out as much power as he could from everybody around him and he just kind of always exploit his resources so to speak yeah, yeah. but i don't think he ever had a, a, a plan of longevity or anything it was always just what what opportunities are uh, placed in front of me and what can i take from that and i think that's why i'm especially during the trial when he knew he was pretending faking all these seizures and yeah all crazy good point stuff. that was that was not a plan that yeah, was yeah. That was that's desperation. That's, yeah, that is very, desperation. That's just is a, a reaction yeah. to where he's at. Yeah, that's Although a good I point. think he's, I think he's, unfortunately, I think he's a brilliant manipulator. Yeah, and obviously a horrible person. But I don't think he had a plan. I don't. I don't think he's, he's had a plan since the eighties. <laughs> I think. Yeah, I think you could look at his past and be like, no, he's just flying by the seat of his pants, trying to use that manipulation to yeah. exploit his way to the top yeah. any way he could. Yep. And he found anybody who'd be willing to listen to him and he'd fully exploit them and manipulate them. So for sure. Yeah. Dangerous, dangerous individual though. Thank God he's in prison. <laughs> but we're going to go wrap up today's episode there. Thanks for hanging with us. This was a, a deep dive. Yeah. I, I recommend everyone check out that docuseries yeah. though on Hulu. Stolen Youth. It's uh they have interviewed footage that is just you. It, it does a great job at depicting how programmed they are because you'll see them uh unprogrammed or deprogrammed and then you'll go back and you'll see when they are programmed especially felicia you can just see can it's tell. like that is a different person right there that's not the same person that we get to see a few years later uh but yeah great docuseries i highly recommend checking it out but that is it for us today we'll see you guys next week and until then lights out everybody <laughs>